Ahoj, pošlekáty Komnopli podcast. So, I made a trip to Amsterdam this weekend uh, to visit uh, Dutch Passion, which is one of the oldest uh, seed company uh, in the world. And this is also one of uh, my old, oldest partner during my career as a, as a writer. I'm sitting here with Mahmoud, who is a head of uh, genetics and new territories in Dutch Passion. And I would like to talk to him for a while. Hi, Mahmoud. How are you doing? Dobry den. I'm doing good, man. How are you doing? <laughs> I'm doing fine. It's a little bit cold here in Amsterdam, but I think it's the same at the, this time uh, in Prague too. So uh, tell me briefly something about uh, Dutch Passion history. It's like a really, for me, it's like a really like old school brand I really like and I am sure that listeners are also familiar with this yeah. name so tell us briefly the story. Yeah so um, Dutch, Passion, Dutch Passion was established in Amsterdam in 1987 so we've been in business for about 35 years. Uh, during those 35 years we've accomplished quite a few things within the cannabis industry. Uh, one of the most important ones and that we are still known for today is the, the introduction of the feminized seed technology to the industry which now is a standard. So before that, we only had regular uh, varieties, so male and female seeds. And then uh, the owner of Dutch Passion found a way to feminize seeds, so to only create uh, a female plants, which give the flowers that we eventually uh, consume. So this was a big thing. Uh, later on, we also pioneered on uh, auto-flowering varieties quite early. We saw the potential. Um, they were not as good as it could be back then, but uh, we saw the potential already from, uh, from the start. Uh, CBD also we embraced on a very early stage, um, which we now we have a strong collection for, and also some other minor cannabinoids as uh, CBG and, uh, and uh, THCV, CBDV. Um, so we are known uh, to be innovators, and we like to keep that uh, keep that going. So whenever there's a new um, new field of cannabis that we can tap into, then uh, we always explore the uh, the opportunities and, uh, and see what we can do. Um, the only continent that we are not working on at the moment is uh, Antarctica for uh, mm -hmm. obvious reasons, but further than that, we are actually working all around the world. Uh, we are genetic partner for licensed producers worldwide. This is something that came into play, let's say, starting 2018. Then legalization, the, 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 the green wave, the legalization wave happened uh, around the world. And you see now that more and more countries are opening up. So in every legal country, there are um, opportunities to grow cannabis legally and then uh, we help those companies to, uh, with starting material. So that's uh, more or less what we do in a nutshell. Mm -hmm. So you mentioned uh, uh, feminization and feminized seed. This is something, uh, yeah, when I started to grow there were no feminized seed and I remember the date or the time when, when it started. So it was like a big thing because before that Maybe young growers don't know that anymore, but uh, at the beginning uh, it was uh, really tough uh, because you need to identify uh, males and females and remove males before they started to produce pollen, which uh, let's say ruined all your uh, all your females because like weed with seeds uh, is not uh, so tasty. It smells a little bit different, and yeah, when you when you smoke joint and there are some seeds inside it's pooping and yeah, it's scratching in in your throat yeah. so so like taste of uh, female flowers without seeds is much much better so and more when potent also. sorry and more potent also because the the female does not have to put the energy in making seeds so that she can just put all the energy in making the flower so the flowers come out more potent as well when there are no seeds in yeah, yeah. so th this is very important uh, thing as well so uh, how, how it started? Like, uh, do you know the history? Do you know how uh, Hank and his friends uh, came out? Uh, came uh, uh, found a way how to how to do that? Yeah. So uh, the owner and founder of Dutch Passion is, uh, like you mentioned, Hank Hank van Dalen. Um, he is a university biologist by uh, by origin, um, and what he did, like he was always experimenting during his study as well with uh, with cannabis. Uh, first with seeds that I found in uh, in coffee shop weed that I bought and they were like imported varieties from from Thailand from from Nigeria Africa 
So they, they started to collecting those seeds and grow, out, grow them out in the Netherlands. So this was the first Dutch grown cannabis. Mm-hmm. Um, being a biologist, he liked to experiment with, uh, with those plants. And he noticed that, uh, as you know, there's an ideal moment of harvesting your plants when they are most mm-hmm. potent. But he noticed that when he let them grow after this point, some of the um, females would grow male flowers. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. actually they are turning hermaphrodite. Mm-hmm. This is actually a survival mechanism of the cannabis plant. So that means that whenever there are females in an area where there's no male, then she can produce male flowers um, to create pollen mm-hmm. so that she can pollinate herself or other females around her so that they can still produce seeds so okay. they can secure the next generation for the next year. Mm-hmm. So actually it's a survival mechanism of the species. Mm-hmm. Um, so he noticed that of a few female plants, there were a few male flowers. Uh, and then his theory was, if I collect the pollen of these male flowers that are being grown on a female a plant, um, if I use this pollen to pollinate other females, that means that both of the parents uh, can only pass on an X chromosome. Mm-hmm. So that means the offspring will only have XX chromosomes, which theoretically would mean they would all be female. So uh, being a, being a bio- biologist, he just took the experiment, uh, collected some pollen, pollinated some females, grew the seeds. Then he grew out the seeds uh, that came from that. And mm-hmm. then uh, he noticed that indeed all the females, all the plants that he was growing mm-hmm. out were, were female. Mm-hmm. Um, so he said, okay, it's possible. Though, so these are fem- feminized seeds. Um, but to, to let your plants grow for such a long time just to have a few male flowers, and you're not mm-hmm. even sure if they will grow, mm-hmm. uh, this was not a very productive process to, to create feminized seeds. So then he went to find um, a way to manipulate this. So in his search on different chemicals and hormones, he eventually found uh, uh, colloidal silver, which he mm-hmm. used uh, to spray the plants. And he noticed that when he was treating the plants with this uh, chemical, the 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 trait of hermaphroditism was coming out and mm-hmm. on an early stage and in, in abundance. Mm-hmm. So there were a lot of male flowers. It depends a little bit on the genetic, but in general, there's a lot of male flowers with a lot of pollen. And then you can use this pollen to pollinate your female um, female plants, and then you can create a lot of seeds, which are mm-hmm. all uh, female because they only have the mm-hmm. XX chromosome. Um, at the time, there were a few people working on this because they thought it was possible, but Hank was the first one to found the Holy Grail mm-hmm. to see exactly how it was done. And uh, Dutch Passion was then the first company to sell feminized seeds in the 90s for about five years. Uh, and now it's a standard in the, in the industry. Everybody mm-hmm. sells, uh, actually, the, like 90, 90, 95 to 97% of all seeds sold are uh, feminized seeds mm-hmm. Yeah, mm-hmm. nowadays. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I think the same is uh, also in other seed banks. But not all uh, seed banks are keeping uh, still uh, regular seeds, like uh, non-feminized seeds, to, yeah. be, uh, to be concrete. Yeah. So you are still selling uh, uh, regular seeds, right? Correct, yeah. We think, uh, as we are breeders, that we think it's important to keep the regular varieties available to our customers as well as, uh, as a service. Like I say, uh, <laughs> um, commercially it's not that interesting because it's only a 2-3% of our mm-hmm. turnover. Um, but we keep it available as a service for, for people that want to make their own projects, their own crosses. Or there's also some old, old school breeders or, or producers that, um, that only want to make uh, or take cuttings from uh, a, a, a real female plant. So yeah, not, not yeah. a feminized plant, but a female plant. Uh, so also for those kind of growers, we keep, uh, we keep it alive. Um, we haven't been adding a lot of new regular varieties for a while because, yeah, like I said, commercially it's not that inter- interesting, but in uh, 2023 we will actually have a new addition. Mm-hmm. So it's only about 10, 11 varieties, but uh, yeah, most of the other cannabis seed companies, they only sell feminized varieties mm-hmm. and we, uh, we still offer them, yeah, the yeah. regular ones. Uh, and uh, nowadays when, uh, like, there is no, uh, like, uh, more or less there is no protection how to keep your intellectual property. It's uh, for many seed banks also like a protection if they don't produce any regular seeds and they produce only feminized seeds. It's also harder to, uh, let's say, steal their uh, work or steal their uh, genetics, you know. So uh, how do you look at it? Because, you know, you, you came on the market with uh, very famous strains, so let's say why, why, uh, White Widow, for example, and we can see lots of strains on market which has uh, 
video in in their name you know because there are lots of copies there are lots of uh, new seed banks how if we can call them like that mm -hmm. who are st trying to uh, sell uh, something would uh, someone else breed it how, how you look at it did you do you fight some somehow with uh, with uh, like a stealing of your genetic yeah um, so the, the situation that we have now the legal situation towards the subjects uh, comes from the legality of the of the plant yeah so we have always been working in, uh, in an illegal situation especially for um, for the breeding purposes um, um, so, like, if you work with a, like, the seeds are exempted from our drug law in the Netherlands. The plants are not. So, whenever you work with an illegal product, it's very mm. hard to protect it. You mm. know, in mm. in the normal uh, agricultural industry, it's very uh, common to to develop a certain variety to then claim the breeder's right. You know, so that it's actually your property, and then anybody that wants to grow your varieties, they need to pay you a royalty or they mm. buy the seeds or whatever. Mm. Um, because cannabis was always illegal the cannabis community was always very open and very uh, about about sharing, you know, and, and giving. So this actually very, it was more like the hippie approach, more or less, you mm -hmm. know, so mm -hmm. um, that is nice in a way, um, but it also means that you cannot protect your work. Like, as you say, sometimes yeah, it takes yeah. you a few years to, ve to develop a certain variety, mm -hmm. and then as soon as you bring it on the market, it's out there mm -hmm. open for everybody to use, mm -hmm. um, which also is maybe charming because this, this was also what the cannabis industry was, you know, about sharing a small community. Mm -hmm. uh, but as cannabis is on a tipping point and going from illegal to legal, um, that also means that it will be treated more as a, a, a normal crop, a normal mm -hmm. um, variety or mm -hmm. uh, uh, species. So that also means that now with the legality, the opportunity comes to protect your intellectual property as well. Mm -hmm. um, so. Of course, we are also looking into these options uh, yeah. towards the future. Up to now, all the all the rights re release are open for to use for uh, for everybody. Uh, but in the future, uh, we are looking more into these options. And when when it's becoming look totally legal, we can actually um, protect our intellectual property and then also mm -hmm. make a different model uh, for it. But this will take maybe a couple more years. Yeah, definitely. Uh, all whole cannabis market needs uh, some work, uh, some time to get to, let's say, normal, uh, because yeah, one thing uh, is if, uh, if you are, so, uh, if, uh, if it's in small scale, if somebody is breeding for himself at home and trying to, uh, trying to make uh, something new from your strains, and the other thing is if somebody only multiply your seeds and try to sell it for, for, for lots of money, yeah, yeah so it's, yeah. Uh, there is a difference, and and I see, uh, and we see that lots of uh, companies are uh, solving this problem. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned something what uh, should be interesting to know for for people, like yeah, we know that uh, growing cannabis is not legal. I think it's not legal in uh, Holland as well, uh, but. You are selling seeds, so wh where are all the seeds uh, coming from? It's like, uh, can you can you tell us or? Uh, this is actually this is this is a question I get all the time, of course, from all people around the, around <laughs> the world, and uh, and it's very understandable because we just have a very strange situation in the Netherlands. And I must admit that most countries that have some kind of regulation about cannabis have a strange rule in a place. Like it's always something. Nobody did it like 100 the correct way. I think um, in the Netherlands, the seeds are exempted from our drug law, which means they are legal. You can freely trade in them. Uh, Cannabis itself, so the flowers, can be sold in the Netherlands as well legally through the coffee shops. They do need a permit. So as a seed company, you do not need a permit. It's totally exempted. So, But for cannabis, it, uh, because it contains THC, you need a permit mm -hmm. to, to sell it. Uh, but both for cannabis in, to be sold in a coffee shop as for cannabis seeds to be sold through the, uh, the seed companies, you need plants. And the plants are illegal. Mm -hmm. yeah. So yeah. up to five plants, it's uh, decriminalized in the Netherlands. So mm -hmm. if you grow, let's say, five plants in your garden or whatever, and your neighbor complains because of the smell and police come, uh, they need to take your plants and you need to give it to them as well. Uh -huh. but, they, but they cannot punish you. So they cannot find yeah. you. Yeah. They cannot uh, do anything. If you have more than five plants, then they can actually also punish you, so giving a fine or anything. Mm. And if you're really a big grower, commercial grower, and especially if you've been caught 
already several times maybe, they can even put you in jail for a maximum of three years. Mm. So a lot of people think, ah, we have coffee shops in the Netherlands, seed companies in the Netherlands, so cannabis is legal. Uh, it's legal to sell the flower, it's legal to sell the, the seeds, but it's illegal to grow the plant. So you tell me how that works. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, honestly, a lot of people think also in Czech uh, is uh, cannabis legal. What is, uh, what is not true, you can also, the same as Holland, uh, you, you can grow five plants, uh, you cannot grow them but it's like uh, not a uh, law possession you know yeah. 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 yeah so you can pay some fee but you will not uh, go to jail yep. but on the other hand if you have uh, i think i know i don't know exactly how it is yeah. now but i think if you if you have uh, like a 10 or 12 grams then you can get in trouble you know so it's uh, you know you can imagine that if you grow five plants Uh, you, you, yeah, definitely. If you have less than uh, 10 grams, you are really, really a bad grower. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> <For sure. laughs> anyway, I was also discussing one thing. I just uh, it just get in my mind. Do you have an idea how many seeds comes from one plant? That really depends on the genetic and it depends on the pollination process. Okay. So some genetics, they are very generous with producing seeds. Some are not. Uh, if the if the pollination process went as optimum as as possible, then you can also create a lot of seeds. And if, the, if it was a poor pollination process, you will end up with less. But let's say anything between, let's say on general between 2,000 and 5,000 seeds per plant is is mm -hmm. very very doable. Yeah. yeah. So we can say that even if five plant with five plants, you can get uh, you can guess, uh, get decent. Uh, yeah, you could you could get like 10 between. 10 and 25,000 uh, seeds, more or less. Okay. Yeah. It's it's lots of seeds yeah, okay. in the end. So, yeah, yeah. good uh, good to know. Yeah. Uh, may may you share with uh, with our listeners uh, like uh, what is optimum stage where you can apply a col uh, a colonial, uh, colonial uh, silver on plants? Yeah. So we what we usually do is like you have a bunch of plants that you want to make seeds mm -hmm. from so those are your seed plants those are mm -hmm. females and then you need uh, a few reversal plants that means the female plants that we're gonna manipulate to produce male flowers so mm -hmm. that we can produce the pollen so what we usually do is like we take three individuals that we're gonna uh, spray colloidal silver on and we start them uh, five days from each other mm -hmm. so let's say the first one we start spraying on day one Mm -hmm. And the second one we start spraying on day five, and mm -hmm. the third one we s start spraying on day ten. Mm -hmm. So that means that um, we, we usually we start spraying uh, from first first week of flowering. Okay. And then that means that by the time that your females are susceptible to receive the pollen, mm -hmm. um, This is usually, let's say, around week three, week four. Mm -hmm. um, then we, then you always have one male, or one female, reversed female, that will be able to produce a lot of, a lot of pollen. Mm -hmm. Because you know, sometimes it takes a little bit longer. Sometimes it takes a bit less for the for the plants to be mm -hmm. uh, susceptible for the for the pollen. So if you have three different f females that will produce pollen, and you start them on different uh, ages or different timelines. You will always have one female that produces a lot of pollen, just mm -hmm. to be sure. Because if you just just do one and the timing is not correct, you know, then you will end up with a lot of with with less seeds. So that's why if you if you if you start them on on different uh, days, then you will increase the chances that mm -hmm. one will be ready to pollinate the other females once they are ready. Mm -hmm. Good, good to know. Uh, thank you for that because yeah, lots of people, you know, I don't think that uh, lots of people will start to produce feminized seeds for themselves yeah. because in a small scale it ma makes not a big sense. Yeah. But anyway, it's uh, good to know good to know also the ways you will not use because it helps you to understand a little bit more to growing process. And I yeah. I think that more you know about growing, it's uh, it's definitely. Yeah. Uh, um, uh, good for you. Yep. Can you tell us how many seeds uh, Dutch Passion is selling during the year, or uh, more or less? Yeah, I think we're looking at around 
1.5 million, it might be a little bit more. Yeah. Very, very, very nice. I can see the field with 1.5 million yeah. of plants. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And, and that's just us. Eh? So think about all the different mm -hmm. seed companies that, mm -hmm. that are out there. Mm -hmm. And they're all selling feminized seeds or mm -hmm. selling seeds to, to the end customer. So just think about the, all the, <laughs> the amount of plants that are being grown worldwide mm -hmm. all the time and in, a, in an illegal situation. So yeah. most plants will never see anybody. But... Mm -hmm. uh, but it's, there's a, there's a lot of plants out there, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> I can. It's hard to it's hard to uh, it's hard to imagine. Uh, you told uh, you told us that uh, you are selling seeds worldwide, uh, except of Antarctica uh, everywhere. Yeah. So uh, I would like to ask you also about Thai market, which uh, now started to develop, and I know you just came back from from hemp. Uh, uh, trade show in Bangkok. Yeah. So, uh, uh, can you tell us briefly how it looks uh, like there? Or yeah. So um, we are genetic partner for licensed producers worldwide, which means that we provide a lot of licensed producers worldwide with our genetics so that they can uh, grow a crop. Um, we have been doing so in Thailand since 2018, mm -hmm. and from the start until uh, last June, we only sold high CBD, low THC varieties, or also our CBG force, which is like mm -hmm. high CBG, low THC, but always low THC varieties. Uh, but since June 9, 2022, Thailand has legalized THC as well. Um, so th I just came back from Bangkok indeed, from a, from a hemp expo, and this was the first time after legalization that I was there. And I didn't know what I, what I saw there. It was like one big green boom and one explosion just mm -hmm. in bangkok there's about four thousand different uh dispensaries where mm -hmm. you can buy uh, high thc cannabis mm -hmm. um so there's yeah there's a lot of potential they have a great climate there's at least for holidays you know for growing they have very high humidity so f so most of the good growing has been is, is being done uh, indoors mm -hmm. um but yeah throughout all of uh, thailand you can now find dispensaries you can buy your weed legally uh, you see LPs, licensed producers, popping up. Uh, we have been supplying f them at first with high CBD. Now they're all asking for high THC mm -hmm. to also supply uh, the yeah. coffee shops or uh, dispensaries. Um, so, yeah, yeah. I, or I mentioned this a few times when I was there. If I, if I was 10, 15 years younger and had no kids and wife and everything that, that's keeping me here, I would, uh, <laughs> I would try my luck there, you know. But uh, there's actually a lot of people thinking the same because I've seen quite some Europeans that I already know from the scene in Europe mm -hmm. that are now trying their luck in uh, in mm -hmm. Thailand. So, uh, but yeah, who can blame them? Beautiful weather, beautiful food, nice people. Yeah, I would have done the same, but uh, mm -hmm. sometimes in a gold rush it's better to sell shovels. So uh, we keep selling seeds. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's right. Uh, like there were a couple of markets which looks at the beginning like it will be like a gold mine, but in the end uh, it was not like that. Yeah. Uh, we can we can see how how market is developing also in other parts of uh, of uh, the world yeah. but 4000 dispensaries in bangkok or in bangkok, yeah. Yeah, yeah so it's uh, incredible incredible number yeah. uh, how much cost uh, wheat at the moment because since i i have been to thailand it's uh, almost 20 years ago and wheat was not so expensive but it was not also very very nice yeah. you know so what's the price for indoor or nice yeah. like a good quality wheat yeah. now in thailand yeah. so uh like you said in the beginning there was always wheat you know that you could find but the quality was very poor and prices weren't at that high but it's just like you don't it's not something you want to smoke at the moment the prices are pretty high uh, because also they just legalized and it's like one now it's the wild wild west you know so people just are just charging prices for whatever they can mm -hmm. so retail price so for the end consumer on general you're paying around 18 to 20 euros mm -hmm. per gram so which is pretty expensive i mm -hmm. think the average price of a gram of cannabis in the dutch coffee shops will lay around maybe 12 euros so mm -hmm. there's like a six to eight euros difference mm -hmm. um, but the quality now is good. Uh, but in Thailand, they work the other way around. Like in Europe, we make the regulatory framework first, and then we're going to legalize. There, they're working the other way around, <laughs> Thai way. Uh, so they first legalize, and now they're going to make the framework bit mm -hmm. by bit. So every month, you know, there's a new law, a new rule coming up, which mm -hmm. they have to comply with. Uh, so I think uh, the price the price need to come down. I also, like uh, what I was told is that n about 80% of the available cannabis at this moment is um, import, mostly from mm -hmm. USA, mm -hmm. and only 20% 20 20 is locally grown. Okay. 
mm-hmm. uh, but the Thai government wants to enforce this, so they want oh. to ban all the import. Mm. Um, so then when there's only locally grown and uh, there's more rules, more regulatory framework, the bad players will be pushed out and then also the, the prices will come down. So I think it will stabilize, but at this moment mm. it's still uh, pretty high. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah, it's really, really high prices if I think about prices in general in Thailand. So yeah. it's like that. You said that uh, most of growers are, or most of wheat is grown indoors. What is like uh, if you, if, if you say Thailand, everybody is seeing uh, sun yeah. and hot. Yeah. So uh, now we have some also energy crisis, which is not only in Europe, it's everywhere. It's also, I can imagine, also in Thailand, they face the same problems. And also lots of people who are not uh, like open to legalization, they will point uh, on a high energy consumption everywhere. It's, uh, we can see it in America, we will see it in Europe. Yeah. And we will for sure see it also in Asia. So uh, you think that conditions in Thailand are so bad for growing outdoors that uh, uh, pr- big producers will be forced to grow indoors? Yeah. Um, well, like you say, Thailand has a great climate for tourism. You know, there is a lot of sun and high temperatures, but for cannabis growing is not necessarily the optimum climate. Mm-hmm. Uh, Thailand also has a lot of microclimate, so every region can be a little bit different, but mm-hmm. um, the very high temperatures, especially in, the, in, in, their, um, uh, in their summertime, can, be, can reach up to 38, 40 degrees, mm-hmm. which mm-hmm. Is, might be a little bit too hot. And also the humidity is killing. Mm-hmm. When I arrived, it was the first day it was 90% humidity. Mm-hmm. Um, well, this is, this is very hard to grow good compact buds in. Mm-hmm. Uh, in this in this mm-hmm. kind of climate, so mm-hmm. uh, energy prices have gone up. That's totally right, but uh, it's not the same prices as in uh, as in Europe. Mm-hmm. Um, so I do think that there's also controlled greenhouses where people can grow decent products. But in order to to, to grow the, the yeah the best quality product, you need to go fully indoor, like fully mm-hmm. automated. So mm-hmm. I do think mm-hmm. that um, there will be a market for everything. Uh, but I think especially the licensed producers that um, the growing, let's say, medical grade or the highest quality, they will always be uh, indoors. Mm. Yeah, yeah. So mm. there's opportunity for everybody, but personally, I would also go uh, fully indoors. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so uh, le- let's go back to Europe. We taste a little bit of Thailand. Uh, uh, let's go back to Dutch Passion as well. Uh, can you tell us what was the f- first uh, strain w- w- what uh, was sold on the Dutch Passion brand? Yeah. So the the first variety that uh, Hank sold uh, does not exist any longer under this name because we had a we had a, a, a letter from a lawyer uh, saying that we couldn't use this name anymore. But the first name was actually uh, Amstel Gold. Okay. Um, so for the beer drinkers amongst you, you m- might know uh, Amstel, which is a big um, beer brand brand as well here in the Netherlands. And then Amstel Gold is actually also uh, I think uh, the name of a, of a beer. Like I don't drink myself, so I'm not the best one to ask, but uh, it, it was definitely a beer. Um, so we renamed this variety to Passion Number no. One, mm-hmm. and this uh, variety is still being sold uh, on the Dutch Passion flag. So this was the the first variety that we introduced. Mm-hmm. Cool, cool. Uh, uh, listeners will for sure know like Mazar, White Widow, Blueberry, Power Plants, Kunk Number no. Eleven. Orange Bud, yeah, of course. Orange Bud was ver- uh, very popular in my group, like because everywhere, uh, everywhere in the world, there are some groups of growers who are connected to each other. So uh, when I started to grow, uh, there were like uh, clones, you know, because uh, feminized seeds was not uh, widespread at the time yet. So we we changed uh, clones, and we also. Uh, bring some clones from Holland at the time, so uh, Orange Bud was in our group, like and and we also had the blueberries, so it was like uh, uh, yeah. So I think the the blueberry, the um, power plant, and the Orange Bud, those were three classical varieties from Dutch Passion that were okay. widely sold uh, in the Dutch coffee shops as well. Mm-hmm. So yeah. nowadays there's a lot of choice, and we d- we have not focused on on, on clones. So the you, Dutch Passion, there are a few coffee shops that sell Dutch Passion varieties, but that's not a lot. Mm-hmm. But back in the day, power plant, orange bud, and blueberry, mm-hmm. almost any coffee shop had uh, yeah. had one yeah. of those. You know, yeah. yeah. White Widow was everywhere. I can, I can. But, but the White Widow, uh, we do have White Widow in our collection, but we cannot claim that we were the the, the first one or okay. the only one. Like White Widow is more a variety that uh, every seed company 
has his own version of White Widow. Mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. So I think actually the the original breeder was uh, uh, Shanti Baba. But there's okay. th there's different different stories around this yeah. variety. But I, I, this is not a, a, a true original Dutch passion variety. I must okay. uh, I must say. Okay, so I'm sorry to Scott if I uh, put his mm, vari variety to someone else. <laughs> I know him, it's like a really cool guy. Yeah. Uh, how many strains does uh, Dutch Passion have uh, at the moment? Uh, at the moment we carry about 60, 65 different varieties. Okay. So both, uh, both uh, photo periods as uh, out of flowering. Yeah, yeah. yeah. cool. Yeah. cool. Uh, after 35 years, so how long it is uh, since uh, Dutch Passion started? It's uh, more than 30 years. Yeah, yeah. Sure. 35. So in 1987 yeah. we were uh, established. Yeah. 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 So it makes sense, but there are also some seed banks uh, which uh, started in January and now they have 80 strains already. Yeah, and you know how that works. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It's, uh, it's something we already discussed also with Simon from Serious Seeds. We, okay. we had a discussion on Cultiva about it as well and I discuss it with everyone who is doing something uh, with seeds. Yeah. I was working in an agriculture company who was selling seeds of uh, of uh, regular, uh, like uh, vegetables. Yeah, 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 not vegetable, but uh, crops. Uh, okay. yeah, yeah, yeah. So nice. anyway, uh, we mentioned also a little bit law in uh, Holland, uh, like uh, something what uh, is known as a backdoor problem that uh, it's possible to sell. Uh, wheat in coffee shops, but it's not uh, legal to uh, to grow plants. So yeah, this is uh, something what is called uh, backdoor problem. Only just to just to explain to listeners. Yeah. Uh, but what is also interesting now is that there is some licensing ex experiment that the government wanted to change this. And what I know, there was like 10 licenses uh, given to uh, several amount of companies. Yeah. So can you tell us something uh, more about it? Yeah. yeah so uh, since the 60s and 70s, we had a liberal cannabis uh, policy. First, they came up with the gedoogbeleid, which means like some kind of decriminalization mm -hmm. for, uh, for, for usage at least. Uh, but and then the next step would be legalization. But, but then the, the government at the time, they, they fell. So they didn't have a chance to actually legalize. And then afterwards, there was never a politician that was that wanted to go down in history as the one that legalized cannabis. Yeah, you know? yeah, and also yeah. we had a lot of pressure from from France, from 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 Germany, from Europe. We were like the drug center of uh, Europe and uh, we had to change this. Um, but then, of course, there were some ideas about regulation or legalization in the Netherlands. And there were different ideas, different initiatives. But never uh, there was never one that really made it up till few years ago and now they came up with a cannabis experiment just like you mm -hmm. mentioned and this is uh, set up to supply the Dutch coffee shops legally um, because now the coffee shop can sell the wheat legally but they have a backdoor problem they, s they buy the wheat illegally so this is a very strange uh, situation so they came up with uh, the experiment so the idea about the, of the experiment is that uh, they wanted to give out 10 licenses to di 10 different companies these companies can then grow cannabis legally to, su to supply coffee shops. Mm -hmm. So 10 municipalities within the Netherlands have been chosen mm -hmm. uh, to participate and all participating municipalities, all the coffee shops within those municipalities are obligated to participate. Mm -hmm. So they don't have a choice. So if mm -hmm. you are in one of those municipalities, you will have to do it. Um, so about 150 applicants filed an application to be one of the 10 licensees. Mm -hmm. um, and then eventually there were, there were 10 selected and uh, Dutch Passion is part of a group uh, mm -hmm. which obtained one of those licenses. So we, okay. we are actually part of this experiment, so we're very happy about that. Um, so now the 10 uh, licensees are now building their facilities. Mm -hmm. And hopefully, like every time it has, been, it has been postponed, because you know this is government. As soon as government comes in, then you know <laughs> things will take a very long time and will, won't be the most efficient. But yeah, this is something that we have to work with. Um, so the idea is that uh, the 10 uh, licensees will grow a, a certain amount of flowers, a certain, mm -hmm. a certain starting amount, because uh, once we go from illegal to legal in the experiment, the coffee shops have about a six-week time frame 
to go from uh, illegal supply to fully legal supply. Mm -hmm. But so in order to do this, you need to have uh, a certain amount of stock because you cannot say after two weeks, okay, uh, the product is finished. You can mm -hmm. go back to your mm -hmm. uh, your uh, illegal uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, supplier. You know, so we need to the ten the ten companies they need to uh, grow uh, a certain basic amount so that we can go make the switch at once and don't have to go back to the mm -hmm. to the mm -hmm. other one. Mm -hmm. uh, but at this moment, uh, the most companies are still building their facilities. This will take some time. Then they need to start growing, which will also take some time. Mm -hmm. Maybe they have to do a few crops, you know, because mm -hmm. they have to build the stock. Mm -hmm. And then once we have enough stock, we're going to make the switch. So when this will exactly happen, we don't know. But I think the first plants within the experiment will be grown at least in 2023. Okay. So you already have a facility or are you still uh, building it? Or, you know, because if, if you don't know yet when it will start, It's also hard to invest in facility and also, you know, if, if you grow too much wheat and it will be postponed, you will have to burn something, you know, it's... Yeah. And that's the thing, it's a very uh, complicated process. Like, mm -hmm. you don't want to be the first, you don't want to be the last. Uh, um, investment can be a thing, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, if you have money, it's okay. If you want to try to find investors, it's a pretty uncertain mm -hmm. um Uh, concept because mm -hmm. you don't know which way it's going to go again the government is involved so they can do today they're going to look this way and tomorrow they're going to go the other way mm -hmm. uh, and those are all things that make it a little bit more complicated but uh, we're enthusiastic about it so at least it's an opportunity uh, it gives us also an opportunity to to grow our varieties out in a totally legal environment mm -hmm. uh, we've been providing other lps with our genetics but we could never do it really ourselves to grow it in a legal environment so Uh, I'm very happy that we uh, have the opportunity to uh, to do that, um, but it's quite a, it's quite quite a process, and uh, yeah, we have to see. We are we actually built to come back to your question. We actually have a found a facility that we need to refurbish. So there was already something in place. So like some other companies they have to build something from scratch. We mm -hmm. have a building and uh, also part of greenhouse that we're just gonna adjust to our wishes, mm -hmm. and then we can we can start relatively quick. Uh, but in what scale and in what speed, um, yeah, this is something to uh, to be considered still because, like you say, yeah. uh, it has a limited shelf life, the cannabis. Yeah. You can cool it. You can. There are ways to, you know, uh, extend shelf life, but you cannot keep it for years or so. Yeah. So, so this is a thing, a timing, a t timing thing. So we need to discuss also with the other uh, licensees mm -hmm. to see, okay, mm -hmm. what is the best way to move forward? You know, who is growing what and in which amounts, and then mm -hmm. we have to make the switch. Yeah. yeah, so this will be quite a process. Yeah. Uh, what is uh, something what interests me uh, is uh, how how the government is thinking about taxes from legal wheat. Like because because what I see everywhere around when when we talk about legalization in other European countries and also what uh, you can see in states and in Canada that. Uh, On one hand, governments want to get uh, some money from from wheat, but on the other hand, the high taxes make uh, uh, cannabis non uh, not available for everyone, or simply people will buy still on the black market. When when legal wheat is too expensive, it makes uh, not a big sense. So uh, so how? how Uh, Dutch government is thinking about this because at the moment, if if I sell wheat in coffee shop, it's legal. I pay taxes from that. Uh, do I understand? If, if, you're, if you are a cannab if you are a coffee shop okay. and you sell cannabis, you you pay taxes about it. Mm -hmm. But when you buy your cannabis, yeah. you don't you, you don't, don't pay, pay taxes, yeah. and also the the growers, of course, also don't mm -hmm. uh, don't pay taxes. Mm -hmm. And the taxes is uh, there is. Uh, Uh, the tax is uh, the same as for other goods, or it's some special tax? Uh, so it's a 21 percent. Okay, okay. Yeah. And when you will grow legally, you will pay uh, taxes the same. There will be not special tax for cannabis, or? Um, this is a good question, actually. I think in the beginning it might be a little bit different, but eventually, in the, if you go to a total legal situation, then you will have to pay taxes. Mm -hmm. about to grow and then also the the retailer also need to pay the taxes yeah. so it yeah. will be just a normal taxable yeah. product yeah. yeah yeah good 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 it's uh, it's better a better option from my point of view because sure. yeah. uh, if you want to, if uh, government will ask you for extra two euros for every gram yeah. it will it will uh, push 
price is uh, much higher and uh, but, uh, but um, the, um, the Dutch government they have been talking to the industry as well not as much as I hoped for but of course they did a bit of research and uh, they do know that they cannot be more expensive than than, uh, black than black market yeah, because yeah. otherwise it just doesn't make sense so they, they do keep this in mind yeah 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 uh, Mahmoud I would like to ask because uh, I know you like uh, growing uh, as well, and you like a plant. What is what is your favorite, uh, the most favorite strain for growing, and what is the m most favorite strain for for using? Yeah, also the uh, the most favorite variety to to use depends on the moment and the occasion, so that can vary. Um, but for the terpene profile and the way it grows, I'm a, I'm a big fan of Mocum's Tulip, mm -hmm. which is a variety mm -hmm. we introduced about two, two, three years ago. Uh, gelato cross with sherbet, so it's more like a USA cross. Uh, but also the more traditional varieties like passion fruit, um, blueberry, all time uh, classic, mm -hmm. you know, those are all varieties that I'm very f fond of, you know, mm -hmm. or. Uh, uh, yeah, so you just sometimes you have some classical varieties that are always good. They always keep good, yeah, yeah. and uh, for other things they're they're more hype. You know, there's a yeah. lot of names and a yes, lot of yes. terpene profiles that are being uh, hyped as well. Uh, um, mm. But um, but the Mokum tulip has a very like a creamy taste, nice mm -hmm. effect. Can even be grown outdoors pretty well because it's finished uh, quite early. Uh, passion fruit is based on a sweet pink grapefruit, also more like towards the citric, but more fruity, sweety uh, kind uh, side of the spectrum. And then I also like the the more gassy varieties mm -hmm. with a gassy terpene profile, like uh, kerosene crash, for example. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. Uh, if you mention Mokam tulip, it's uh, also good to explain where the uh, name came from because I don't think that uh, I think more than ninety percent people doesn't know uh, don't know where it came from. Can you, can you explain it? The Mokam, uh, especially Mokam. Yeah, Mokum is actually a slang word. So it comes from the Yiddish, so actually from the from the Hebrew Jewish uh -huh. kind of history. Uh, so Mokum actually means officially it means city. Uh, so it can be any city, but in in Dutch slang, if you're talking about Mokum, you're talking about Amsterdam. Okay. So so Amsterdam, aka Mokum, that, that's it's also known as as Mokum. And then because of the the sweet, uh, delicate smell of the Mokum tulip. Variety. It reminded of us. It reminded us really of a of a Dutch uh, tulip, which mm -hmm. is of course our mm -hmm. our national flower. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, we said okay. We we combine the heritage of the flower and the and the and the Yiddish that we had. So uh, Mokum Mokum's tulip. Yeah, we thought it was a cool name for a yeah. for a variety like this. Yeah. yeah, it's interesting for me. I I love stories, you know. So it's yeah. like when when the story is behind the name, yeah. it's always good because lots of names are like uh, let's say. Uh, like orange but it's uh, very simple you, you uh, once you grow it you know where the came, name yeah. came from yeah. because buds are really yeah. uh pistols are, pistols are orange, yeah. very orange so yeah. so it's clear but more comes to lip it's uh, like yeah. lots of people have no idea where it yeah. where it came from yeah. Yeah. yeah okay uh i'm checking my question list and i see that we we are almost in the end. I, I'm asking everyone. Uh, I make an interview with. Uh, can you mm, tell some message to listeners or to cannabis community in general? Um, like in general, like if you are a grower since all times, so before legalization, that means that you contributed to actually the legalization of cannabis. Like even though it was not possible, you still took the risk uh, and you had the courage to to actually grow a plant, you know, which is just nature. Um, so I think the most people that are growing cannabis are people that are open-minded and they think for themselves usually. Um, so they are critical people that don't just take anything uh, that's being offered to them for, for true. Um, so I would, uh, so I think big up for you, big respect for all the growers that have been growing uh, despite the illegality of the product uh, and keep keep thinking for yourself and keep doing the things that you think are right because if government make a choice for everybody doesn't mean it's, it's the right choice for everybody and how can you how can you forbid a, a piece of nature you know because it's just a plant that grows in nature you dry it you don't do anything and it's, and it's there ready to use so i think it's a ridiculous uh, phenomenon that is that is illegal and it's such a versatile plant we can do so many things with it there's so many medicines so people 
are being, you know, like if you take the CBD, if you take Charlotte's, um, Charlotte's Web, for example, the, the girl, mm -hmm. you know, the, she, she really <coughs> bloomed from using CBD. So that means this is also cannabis. It's not just THC and the drug mm -hmm. users. So uh, let's, let's focus on the positive sides of cannabis and, uh, mm -hmm. and see what this plant can bring us instead of just putting people in jail for, for smoking a joint, you know? Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. I only, uh, as a reminder, I can uh, tell people that uh, on my website uh, www.pestova.cz uh, you will find uh, some information about our discussion with Mahmoud. You will find there also a link to Dash Passion website and a link to some varieties we were talking about today. So thank you, Mahmoud. It was a pleasure for me to talk to you. I'm very happy to uh, visit the uh, Dutch Passion headquarters because I have cooperation with Dutch Passion for more than 12 years and I, this is the first time I'm here. Yeah. So uh, it was my pleasure to talk to you and I think this is not the last time we have some talk. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you for having me. It was a pleasure to talk to you as well. The visit was long due, but uh, I'm sure we uh, will see more of each other in the future. For yeah, sure. Yeah. For sure. Bye-bye. Ciao. Ciao. Ciao.